During the personal ministry of our Lord upon the earth, he dealt primarily with one race of people only. He told the Jewish people to whom he had come in a special way that he had come to fulfill their law. In the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 17. And though he had come to fulfill their law, there were other objectives which he came to accomplish. But because of the restrictive nature of that purpose of his, he spent his time, most of his energies, working with that one race of people. But it was not done exclusively so. The transition from the old Jewish economy to a religion that was worldwide in its scope and that would embrace every man began to be enunciated by the Lord even as it had been predicted by the prophets before him. While he was here upon the earth, he made at least one visit into the coasts of, of Tyre and Sidon. There he preached and there he healed. In the seventh chapter of the book of Mark, he encountered the Syrophoenician woman who begged for and obtained the crumbs of consideration which fell from Jewish tables. It was in that same seventh chapter of the book of Mark, now in the area of Decapolis, that the consensus of opinion was expressed that he doeth all things well. This was the opinion expressed because of the fact that a non-Jewish audience had seen the miraculous power of our Lord demonstrated in the healing among that people. In the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus leaves Nazareth and goes over to Capernaum, into the Galilee of the Gentiles, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says that the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them that sat in the region and shadow of death, to them did light spring up. Though his work was done for the most part among one race of people, I think that he proved conclusively that he had not come to be a local leader but a world's redeemer by allowing declarations and promises that were worldwide and world lasting in their significance and scope to fall periodically from his gracious lips long before he spoke the words of the Great Commission. In the 12th chapter of the book of John, for example, some Grecian people come to Philip, one of the disciples, with a statement, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip takes these people to Andrew, and then the two of them together go to Christ, who began with this as the point of, of beginning a sermon. And that sermon began by saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. And that sermon ended with him saying, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. In the eighth chapter of the book of John and in verse 12, Jesus said emphatically, I am the light of the world, not of the physical world, but the world of men. In the first chapter of John and in verse 9, John had introduced him as that light that lighteth every man coming into the world. In the 13th chapter of Matthew and in verse 38, Jesus showed that the field in which he, the Son of Man, would be sowing the good seed was the world. That's the word, the word cosmos describes that thought of his. That's the physical universe. That's China and that's Russia. And that's Nigeria and that's Sierra Leone and that's Togo and Dahomey. And that's New Guinea and all of the other places of the world. And our Lord said, there's where I'm going to be sowing the good seed. No portion of this earth accepted. But I suppose that of all of the statements made by him, that showed in a very conclusive way that he had come, as we've suggested, not to be localized in his uh, thinking, not to be restricted to any area or into any geographical clime, I suppose that none shows better his attitude toward the heathen and the attitude that he wanted the Jews of that day to also demonstrate toward the heathen and the attitude that he wants us to show toward the heathen. I say there are no better words than these found in the 10th chapter of the book of John and in verse 16 where Jesus said, Other sheep I have 
which are not of this fold, them also shall I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and shall be one flock and one shepherd. While these words were spoken first of all, or the first time, to show the Jews of that day that soon the middle wall of partition would be broken down, the barriers between nations would be eliminated, the color scheme of the race would soon be blended into one, and that Jewish exclusivism was at an end, I believe that they have meaning and significance for our day. I believe that Jesus intended to show not only the Jews of that day that Jewish exclusivism has neither part nor lot in the eternal scheme of things, but I believe that he would have us to know in our day that American exclusivism is no less favored by him. I believe that these words show that he intended to bring all men within the warm embrace of his tender heart, and that since he died for every man, that every man has become a subject of the mediatorial kingdom that he established, and that every man would be the recipient of the proffered grace and mercy of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I believe that if they have a word for our day, it is simply this, that all, <clears throat> that all of those peoples of the world today, not presently folded, that is, not everyone with, who is within this fold of his, the church of the Lord, become the part and the parcel of the stewardship of the missionary church of our day. When Jesus first spoke these words, of course, he was still looking onward to the time that he would be laying down his life for his sheep. But in that view that he, God of all of humanity, standing before him as they will stand before him in the day of judgment, he looked onward as well and saw far afield the nations and the tribes of men who live in all of the ages of the earth, the unborn nations or the unborn generations standing before him and in a broad prophetic sweep he looks into the faces of each one of these and recognizes that some of them are his. He recognizes that some of these will one day look upon him and call him theirs. He knows that in each one of these places there will be those that he can lead by the side of still waters through green pastures if only if only his servants will be faithful and present him to the peoples of the earth. And so looking into the faces of these people, lost and undone, without a shepherd, moved with compassion as he was often done while here upon this earth, he saw the terrible condition of the heathen, saw them without a shepherd and without access to his fold, wandering upon every high hill and dying in every thirsty land where no water is, and with strong conviction that in every land where he is preached, there will be sheep who will hear his voice and will make the proper response to the overtures of his gospel. And so he says, them also must I bring. My brethren, I do not believe that apathetic indifference which has characterized us in the past nor faint-hearted doubt that may characterize us in this moment and in the immediate future or to weaken our hands the task that we have been assigned by our Lord. The prospects for success in this new endeavor, that of going to every tribe on the face of the earth as the Christian imperialists that we ought to be, ought to be found doing without being told. I say that the prospects for success may be very dark, the power of the enemy may be very great, and our resources at times may, may seem to be woefully inadequate for the task that is ours. But I believe that if we can see the heathen peoples of the world through the eyes of Christ and feel for them with a heart of Christ, that we too will conclude that they, these, must also be brought unto him and into his fold. There's a lot we don't know about these people at this moment. We do not know, for example, who these people are. There's not an anthropologist on the face of the earth tonight who could call adequately and without any mistakes the roll call of the tribes. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. The geography of the tribal peoples has yet to be written. We don't know how many there are. It's obvious that a census has not been taken 
when we don't even know where the people are or who they are. No head counters have gone among the head hunters. And while we do not know who they are or where they are or how many they are, we know, my brethren, that they are. And that's enough for us to know. But we know more than that. Not only do we know that they exist, but we know how they exist. They're lost. Not lost because of the fact that they worship idols. They're not lost because of their pagan religions, their fetishes. They're lost because they have sinned and because they do not have a savior. They do not know the cross of Christ, the tree upon which Jesus died. That tree upon which he died is to them, as it is to us, the tree of life. All men brought to that tree live, and all others die. It ought to be enough for us to know that God not only wills that they should be saved, he's not willing that any should perish, Second Peter 3 and 9, but God also wills that you and I should go to them and bring them into this fold. That's his will for them and for us. Even the prophet Isaiah, as other prophets before him and after him, spoke of our involvement in world evangelism. In Isaiah, the second chapter, verses 1 and th through 3, there's a marvelous passage to which we've gone many times for other than evangelistic thrusts. We've gone there to look and see what Isaiah saw as he pointed toward the last days and the mountain of the Lord's house that will be established in the top of the mountain and that will be exalted above the hills with all of the nations flowing into it. Isaiah said more than that. He said that there will be many people who will go and say, Come ye, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We've read that many times, probably without seeing the evangelistic emphasis that is there. It's even, it has even been predicted that we're going to be evangelistically inclined. Actually, what Isaiah sees in this flow of nations, or flow from the nations, the nation, nations of men, the tribal peoples, and we'll come to that in a moment, and show that the tribes are there, definitely. Spelled out, they are there. They're referred to. The tribes of the world. What Isaiah says in this flow of humanity going into the house of the Lord is really humanity's enthusiastic response to this preaching of the gospel. For the gospel is preached. Isaiah says that the gospel is preached and that's what causes the flow that comes by way of response. A river flows, but a river flows only when the tributaries that spill their precious cargoes into the main stream arises to the point that they cannot contain themselves anymore unless they overflow. The whole of this body of water begins to move. It moves because it cannot do otherwise. Isaiah's prophecy is evangelistic to the core. First of all, let's notice some of the things that Isaiah sees in this prophecy. There's the flow, of course, that we've mentioned. The flow results when the dwellers in that house there upon the hill do their evangelistic chores. I don't know very many houses without assignments. I know that in my house there are assignments that have to be carried out by various ones. And those who dwell upon that hill in the Lord's house have their evangelistic assignments spelled out to them. Now, Isaiah, Isaiah sees a marvelous spectacle. He sees a spectacle of flowing humanity, a stream flowing uphill. Notice that the mountain of the Lord's house is the reservoir into which this flow eventually finds its residence. It's flowing uphill, defying the laws of gravity, defying everything that is rational and right about it, and yet the flow is there. And while he looks upon it and thinks in terms of the explanation for this phenomenon, in all probability in his, in his inspired mind at this moment, he finds it and, and includes that. For he says that this flow results when those who live in that house, those who are evangelized, become evangelists, each one of them. Notice. 
I just said that many people there are the members of the church of the Lord, the family of God. Many people, many people will go. They have now taken up the task. Each one of them has assumed the responsibility that is his. The Lord did not bring us into the church to sit here and to turn our faces in holy dullness in the direction of the pulpit periodically for another round of balcony Christianity. He wants us to work. He's brought us from the low grounds up to the high ground for the purpose of giving us these assignments. And so many people, many people will go. We have become evangelists. Isaiah sees us. We're in this picture, aren't we? Many people will go and say, here is the missionary then, going to and fro, leaving, actually not really going outside the, the sacred precincts of that house, but going to the peoples and causing the flow from nations. Many people will go and say, come ye, let us go into the mountain of the Lord's house. There's their message. And that's the message that you and I are to have. And if in this day we do not see the inflow of nations our peoples from the low ground flowing into the high ground of safety. It is because of the fact that those dwellers in the house there on the hill are content to sit there alone in their smugness, in their selfishness, in their unconcern, and in their lost condition. If there is not an inflow of, of nations today into the house of God, it is because of the fact that there has not been an outflow of the gospel because the inflow of peoples is directly proportionate to the outflow of the gospel. And I really believe that the day that Jesus stood upon the mountain and gave in his valedictory address the most militant command ever to fall upon human ears, the Great Commission, I believe that he was giving but a doctrinal vehicle by which the Lord could ensure that this prophetic utterance of Isaiah could be fulfilled. He wanted, he wanted Isaiah's prophecy to be fulfilled, and so he called some disciples to himself. And he said into, in effect to them, now we're going to establish the church one of these days, and Isaiah has already predicted that there's going to be a flow of people, so I want all of you men to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to all the nations so that we can start this flow coming this way. In effect, that's what he said. In the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, of which Isaiah, of course, is a part, the Septuagint, Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, widely extant, I think, in Jesus' day, probably used by him, referred to, uh, to by him many times, some of the passages that he used, the words that Isaiah employs in this Greek translation of the Old Testament are these. Panta ta ethne. All the nations, panta ta ethne. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, according to Matthew, he said, All authority is mine in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and disciplize or make disciples of panta ta ethne, all the nations. When Luke said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, the all nations part comes from this same Greek phrase, panta ta ethne. No wonder then Isaiah is called the fifth gospel. It contains the great commission, really, for the nations of the world, all the nations that Jesus referred to, have already been covered by Isaiah in his prophetic words. The word ethne in Isaiah's account and Matthew's account and, and Luke's account of the great commission give to us in the English language the word ethnic, a word that describes the divisions and the classifications of men. Ethnic distinctions are made along cultural and tribal and linguistic lines, customs and race and origin and geography, and uh, beliefs and colors and even morality are ethnic distinctions and help to divide peoples and to classify them and to group them. So when Jesus said, go into all of the world, or make disciples of all the nations, he meant more than that we should go into China or to Russia, into the sovereign states of the world, but he intended to, for us to go to every tribal classification, every group, every ethnic distinction of men, every homogeneous group of peoples on the face of the earth. And my brethren, it excites me tonight 
to sit here, to sit with you, to stand before you as you sit, and talk with you tonight about a new venture, a new emphasis in Churches of Christ. But the prospect for actually participating in this is so all-consuming that I can scarcely contain myself as I speak of it. And I think that the thing that is so fascinating and intriguing about it all is the prospect that there is for many in this audience, and I want this so much, I want to be a part of this so much myself. The prospect is, I think, for many of us to lead an entire nation of people, a tribal group of people, to the Lord and to start a little flow of our own, a rivulet, a stream, a trickling rill that hopefully can be joined by others and we can start this flow from the nations once again. I've read in recent months a number of stories or histories of work among tribal peoples being done by denominational people. Churches of Christ have really yet to begin this emphasis. There have been a few works begun by our brethren, just a few. And so we do not uh, mean to say that this is the first uh, time that this has ever been thought of. We don't want to leave that impression at all. But not enough has been done to indicate as yet to us we haven't done it long enough to know really what our response is going to be. But I read just recently the story of the Donny tribesmen down in New Guinea converted by a denominational group. The Donnies lived there and have lived there for centuries unknown to any man outside of their little area of confinement. It took a world war and a crashing plane on which there were some survivors to find the Donny tribesmen. When those who survived the crash of this plane radioed back to their base and asked for some help and some supplies and for rescue, that brought a whole uh, uh, fleet of planes and helicopters that brought in uh, aid and the rescue was affected. But the discovery of the, of the Donny tribesmen by some of those people who participated in this rescue was a lasting, the impression was lasting. And after the war was over, they joined a denominational group and went in to reach the Donny tribesmen. The work was slow and tedious and even dangerous for them. Dangerous because of the fact that the tribesmen had never seen a white man. They had seen the white skin before, but they were in airplanes that had crashed, and there were no survivors in some of those. And so the planes that flew over that area that they saw during the war, they referred to them as the steel birds. They knew they were steel because some had crashed, and they'd made their instruments of war out of that. They were a very warlike people. But when these survivors were there, and they saw the white man moving around, they just knew that spirits from another world had come among them. But eventually, those who went in to teach the tribesmen learned, first of all, their language, then reduced it to writing, then wrote a dictionary, then translated the Bible, and then taught the Donnies to read, and then preached their gospel to these tribesmen. And the thing that was so impressive to me in all of this and, and gives to me the great urge to want to have a part in this is that when these tribesmen received the smallest biblical concept, they could not wait. They ran to their neighbors, didn't have it fully uh, formulated in their own minds. They couldn't say it like it ought to be said, even as their denominational teachers had taught them. They embarrassed their, their teachers, but they went everywhere preaching what they understood. And that's the thing that makes me to know that there is within the prospect for each one of us who goes to lead an entire nation and race and ethnic group of people to the Lord. That prospect is ours. I said a moment ago that there will be dangers for those who go. I think there were dangers for them. I just somehow do not believe it will be a dangerous mission for us. For Jesus will be along. Is it dangerous to go where Jesus goes? Does one have to have courage to follow his leadership? I cannot believe that he who said, These also must I bring of the tribes, people of this world, failed to really mean what he said when he did say, You go and lo, I'll be with you. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 7, that no man goes to war at his own expense. We don't go at our own expense. 
In 2 Corinthians 3 and 5, Paul says we don't go at our own sufficiency. I believe that the ones who go even into the savage tribesmen of the world will be cradled in the providential care and keeping of God and will be just as safe and secure, safer, than if you were here, and certainly if you were here without his presence and help. Our Lord will help us. He'll go along with us, not as a curious onlooker to see what's going to happen, but to make things happen, and I think he'll make things happen in three ways. He'll be working in us, filling our hearts with his grace, and giving sanctity or sanctifying our service unto him. I believe that he will work with us, helping our weakness, enlightening our ignorance, directing our steps, and adding his blessing to all of our feeble efforts to make it enough. And I believe that he'll work for us, opening doors among the nations, ordering the course of providence, and making his servant immortal until his job is done. I believe that. I believe that he will not only make us om omnipotent, make it possible for us to do all things through him who strengthens us. There is not only guaranteed for the child of God omnipotence, but I believe immortality here on earth, as, at least until your work is done. I believe the Apostle Paul would establish this fact for us. In Philippians, the first chapter, the Apostle Paul says there are two propositions set before me, and each one of them is inviting. I have a strong desire to depart and be with the Lord. That's far better. But I know, he said, it'll be far better for you for me to stay. And in verse 25 of Philippians 1, Paul said, having this confidence that it is better for me to stay, I know that I shall abide. And the word there, know, is the word oida. And I have been told by those who know the meaning of these Greek words, where I do not, say that the word oida means that this is a knowledge that is, that is knowledge, that is as knowledgeable as anything, as, as anything as is knowledgeable. You can know it as, as well as you can know anything. It just means it that well. And that one can base a conclusion upon this knowledge, knowing that all of the evidence is in. No possibility that tomorrow somebody's going to come along with a fresh bit of evidence that would just uh, know what you have concluded on yesterday. Because when you know something, you can know it and rest assured. And Paul says, I know that I shall abide. He had already discussed in the 20th verse how long he knew that he would be abiding. He said, I know that I will abide until my work is done, until by my death I will give greater glory to God, verse 20, than by my life. But in one or the other, I'm going to glorify him and in both of them eventually. I don't believe, my brethren that God has to guarantee us that we shall be spared from death when we go into the tribal groups of the world or into any place of danger considered so by others for him. I don't believe that he would need to devise any means of protecting me, at least in my present concepts, from death. When I understand what death is, when I know that death is the vestibule into life everlasting, when it is the gate into immortality, must God protect me from that? If I can glorify him in my life, that I want to do. If I can better glorify him, having finished my work by my death, that's what I want to do. And I don't expect to think that it's a dangerous mission that he sent me on when I am busily engaged with him, a co-worker with him, in the greatest work on earth. God will be with us as we go. And so helped by him, it'll be wrong, I think, for us to be afraid. It'll be wrong not to expect great things to happen. It'll be wrong not to attempt great things. I think it'll be wrong for us not to dare. Spurgeon said, any fool can do what he can do, but only he who sees the unseen will ever accomplish the impossible. So, who will answer when the Lord calls for the raw, the gutty recruit to be his expendables in the heathen slime pits of the world? Who will voluntarily become an exile from the greatest country on earth with all of its creature comforts to become a nomad and a no-man in a solitary, steaming, stinking jungle in order to share your prospects of heaven with a savage creature who was also made in the image of God? Who will literally decide to die before he leaves home? so that he will not have to count the cost of dying on foreign soil. 
as he attempts to reach the man with the gospel who will put him to death for trying. Who will do that? With the Lord going with you? Who would not dare? Who will lay down his life up on the altar of sacrifice in order to preach the gospel of Christ to the savage Mutalones of Venezuela? Who will preach Christ to the Masakin Kisar or to the Masakin Tiwal of the proud Nuba people of the Sudan? Who will go and live among the Ik tribesmen of Upper Uganda, a people whose struggle for existence has been so exceedingly harsh that they're bereft of all human instincts and emotional stir, a people who have suffered so much that the only feeling that they know how to express is the feeling of pain and by some strange distortion of human instincts. When they are pained, they laugh instead of cry. Who will take the Ik tribesman by the hand and say to him, Come ye, let's go up into the mountain of the Lord's house. Who will do that? Before you can do that, you're going to have to tell him that his God, Didi Juare, the sky God, is not only dead but never lived. And that compassion and love and human kindness that he does not recognize is really not weakness but strength. Who will live among the Ik tribesmen long enough to win his heart and his confidence and finally convey unto him not only that you love but that God loves and that that's the, that's the attribute that God has. It's going to take a long time for he now derides, he now derides that characteristic of love. It's going to take a long time to teach him. Who will follow the Abajar tribesmen to the hills and preach Christ to him when the Baro River floods his Ethiopian lowlands? Who will go to the Waura, the Brazilian Indian of the hidden Zingu? The Lord says, these also must I bring. But I cannot conclude tonight by just giving the challenge before us, I want to say something that may be both startling to you and uh, to me when we really catch the concept that I'm trying to convey, and yet saddened at the same time, challenged, thrilled, and saddened. But I do believe with all of my heart that someone is going to these tribesmen, consistent with his will that none should perish, and in keeping with the prophetic utterance that all peoples and nations and languages shall serve him. Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse 14. And in view of the fact that he has already purchased men out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and has made them unto our God kings and priests. Revelation, the fifth chapter, verses 9 and 10. He has already purchased these. That means that he has made meticulous provision for the fulfillment of these prophetic utterances, someone will go. How beautiful the feet of those who go. Are these my feet? Are these yours? Somebody's going to these people, for God's heaven is going to be filled. And he's already named the ones who will be there. From every tribe they will come, and from every language they will be speaking. Somebody's going. I'm sure that you're already ahead of me in thinking of Mordecai's statement to Esther. If thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Somebody's going, Mordecai said. It could be you. And then he said, Who knoweth? Who knoweth whether thou art come into the kingdom for such a time as this? Somebody's going to the tribesmen. If you and I do not go, somebody's going. Enlargement and deliverance will come. Is it possible that this generation has contributed only one thing? In Romans, the second chapter, verse 24, the Apostle Paul says that the name of God has been blasphemed among the heathen, the tribesmen the ethnic divisions of this world because of you. Is that the only contribution that we've made? Can't we make a better one than that? Let us work then, brethren, 
until we see all of the families of men sitting and clothed and in their right minds. Let's duplicate the achievement of the early church when the apostles were the missionaries and when miracles were their proofs. We don't need either. We still have the apostles with us and we still have the word of God that they use to confirm their word. We do not need their miracles and I want us to say that so that we can be convinced of the fact that we do not live in inferior times. The gospel is still powerful and it just needs to be preached. Let us be like the shepherds in the lonely mountain glens then who sees in the fast falling snow a summons to the hills. Let us labor through the night and through the day and through the night and through the day until at last we can labor no longer being driven on by him who constantly says to us other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also must I bring and may our reply always be not just from lips that speak in forums but with hearts and lives let us say them also will we bring or die.